<clears throat> uh, thanks very much, Dr. Goldenberg. Uh, as uh, Dr. Goldenberg said, it's a, it's a big uh, field, so we'll be touching on a lot of uh, different things today. Uh, in our practices, we're seeing increasing numbers of patients who are taking natural health products and supplements, uh, also called complementary or alternative medicines. Natural health products includes uh, vitamins and minerals, herbal remedies, homeopathy, uh, traditional or Chinese and Indian medicines, uh, probiotics and other health products such as amino acids and essential uh, fatty acids. Now, natural health products are big business. Uh, our patients might even be more likely to be taking natural health products than traditional Western medicine. Over 70% of Canadians use natural health products on a regular basis, and natural health product expenditures exceed $50 billion per year in the United States. An analysis of the PCPT uh, data showed that over 85% of the patients in, uh, in the prostate cancer prevention trial were uh, using natural health supplements uh, amongst prostate cancer diagnosed patients. So obviously some knowledge of what the majority of our patients are taking is uh, necessary. Now one of the main hesitations with natural health products or non-prescription nutraceuticals is that they're, it's a largely unregulated business. Uh, in the United States these products are registered as food and therefore lay outside of the FDA's drug rules. There's no provisions in the law for the FDA to approve or deny a, a nutraceutical uh, as long as there's a warning on the label such as this that the FDA has not uh, evaluated the product. Products can be marketed uh, in any way they desire without proof uh, of efficacy. They do have to show uh, safety uh, and track their safety in the long run, however. Now there's always going to be some people who take advantage of those regulations, uh, so it leads to significant skepticism by a lot of uh, physicians about natural health products. Uh, in Canada, under the natural health product regulation, uh, all natural health products have to be licensed before they can be distributed. Uh, to get a license, applicants uh, provide uh, detailed information about the product to Health Canada. Uh, about safety and efficacy. Um, once Health Canada has assessed and accepted the product, they're issued a natural health identification number and must uh, be identified on all packaging <clears throat> uh, seen there by the NPN. Uh, however, while products are awaiting evaluation, they can be sold in Canada. Uh, they're granted an exemption number uh, and then can be legally sold. So uh, quite obviously many clinicians have hesitation in recommending or supporting natural health product industry. Uh, there's numerous potential concerns including uh, safety and standardization. Uh, for many natural health products the data regarding their efficacy and their pharmacodynamics is uh, unclear. As well their purity, preparation and quality is often not well documented or studied. Most studies are of small sample sizes, often not following strict scientific formulas. Uh, and some of them produce conflicting results. But the trouble is, is that because many patients see these as natural uh, and not man-made chemicals, they're more likely to interpret them as safe. Uh, without knowing the actual mechanisms that a lot of these work by, it's difficult to predict drug interactions and, and various other safety parameters. So over the course of this talk, I hope to review some of the data on uh, the most common phytotherapeutics and natural health supplements that we might see in practice, uh, their proposed clinical use and the uh, data supporting their efficacy. First let's uh, talk about BPH. Uh, numerous natural health supplements or phytotherapies have been suggested as potential uh, treatment of BPH. Uh, currently, neither the CUA nor the AUA guidelines on BPH management support the use of phytotherapeutics as first line. Uh, here we'll uh, review the most common. Uh, we see saw palmetto, uh, the African plum, rye pollen, and uh, African stargrass or beta cestosterol. Saw palmetto, uh, also known as uh, Serenoa repens, 
uh, is a commonly known uh, as the African dwarf palm or the cabbage palm. It's the most commonly used natural health supplement for BPH. Uh, the saw palmetto produces berries that are ground into powder or made into a juice, and uh, a lipophilic extract referred to as permixon is uh, extracted using hexane carbon dioxide or ethanol extraction. And the permixon is thought to be the uh, active ingredient. The mechanism action and, and even the active ingredient in salt palmetto is, is not proven. The active ingredient is thought to be contained in that lipophilic extract um, fraction uh, that's high in fatty acids. There have been many theories put forth as to the mechanism of action of salt palmetto, including alteration in cholesterol metabolism, anti-estrogenic or anti-androgenic effects, uh, acting as a weak surrogate 5-alpha reductase, uh, anti-inflammatory effects, a uh, decrease in sex hormone binding globulin, uh, pro-apoptotic properties, alpha blockade, or inhibition of the uh, insulin-like growth factor signaling pathway. None of these have been conclusively proven. There's been numerous uh, studies in, in saw palmetto that have looked at its use in BPH. Uh, most are limited by their small sample size, their short duration, and their failure to use standardized outcome measures, uh, or lack of blinding, but there is some uh, reasonable data. The best available data that we have uh, comes from two studies. Uh, there's a large randomized uh, double-blind placebo-controlled trial that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, and uh, recently uh, the available data has been uh, synthesized in a Cochrane database uh, systematic review. The New England Journal study is a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled study that randomized 225 men over the age of 49 who had moderate uh, to severe symptoms of BPH on the AUA symptom index. Uh, they received one year of treatment with either placebo or saw palmetto extract. The primary outcomes were changes in AUA symptom score, changes in peak urinary flow, nocturia. Men were excluded if they were already taking other therapies for BPH. As you can see here, they had a one-month placebo run-in, and there was a small but significant improvement in both groups in this placebo uh, run-in period. Uh, at one year, both groups had a small but uh, significant improvement uh, in their symptom score. The, uh, the change uh, was 0 0.68 in the saw palmetto group and 0 0.72 points on the AUA symptom scale for the placebo group. They were not statistically uh, uh, different from one another in, in response, but they were uh, significant from baseline. Here we uh, look at this graph of peak urinary flow rate, uh, and we see that there's no objective difference seen in peak urinary flow rate at one year. There were no significant increases in serious adverse events in the intervention versus placebo. A total of 26 serious adverse events occurred during the study, eight of them in the saw palmetto group, 18 in the placebo group. Uh, non-serious adverse events were similarly uh, equivalent. Uh, so in summary, this New England Journal study is the largest randomized control trial of, of saw palmetto to date. Uh, they found that using 160 milligrams of saw palmetto extract twice daily for one year did not improve lower urinary tract symptoms and caused by BPH uh, compared to placebo. The Cochrane co collaboration uh, reviewed the available data uh, on saw palmetto efficacy, uh, updated to 2010. <coughs> they looked at studies that reported change in IPSS, nocturia, peak flow, and adverse events. When we look at the synthesized data on IPSS, two studies reported uh, outcome measures for this. Both studies showed that saw palmetto was no better uh, than placebo in lowering IPSS scores. 
total of nine trials compared nocturia at endpoint. If all the studies were included, there was a slight but significant uh, decrease in nocturia. But this had significant heterogeneity. When only studies of greater than 40 patients were included, there was no difference in nocturia versus placebo. <clears throat> Ten trials have uh, reported peak urinary flow rates, and a meta-analysis of the pooled data found no significant difference. Only uh, five studies that were placebo-controlled reported on adverse events, and there were no more reported events in the placebo uh, versus treatment arms, and less than 5% of patients reported any adverse reaction to uh, saw palmetto, indicating that saw palmetto is well tolerated. So the conclusions of the authors of the meta-analysis and systematic review of the literature of the Cochrane uh, database is that saw palmetto provides no substantial benefit over placebo for the treatment of uh, benign prostatic hypertrophy. <clears throat> but what's the bottom line? Saw palmetto does appear to be safe. It doesn't appear to be any uh, superior to placebo. Uh, but a 30% uh, placebo effect, is it worth considering in uh, some of our patient population? Right. Saw palmetto? It depends on the, um, on the formulation that you get. You know, you can get a, a pack of uh, 250 tabs at Costco for about $30 a month, uh, but other... There's so many different formulations out there that goes anywhere from about $30 to $100 or more dollars a month. Are these studies just taking random drugs off the shelf? Or do they standardize them? They all use different, uh, different combinations, and they were, they were all um, unstandardized doses. Um, they... The, because we don't know the active ingredient, we can't particularly standardize the dose of it. Um, so they, uh, in the large New England Journal study, they took 160 milligram saw palmetto berry extract. So 160 milligrams of the lipophilic extract, but it's difficult to standardize when we don't know what, uh, what is the active ingredient. Another uh, popular phytotherapeutic for BPH is Pygium africanum, or the extract from the bark of the African prune tree or plum tree. It's been used extensively in Europe since the late 1960s for the treatment of BPH. The mechanism of action of, uh, of African prune is unknown, uh, but multiple theories uh, have been put forth, including decreased production of inflammatory leukotrienes, decreased production of adrenal androgens, restoration of secretor activity of prostatic epithelium, and overall anti-inflammatory and anti-proliferative properties. There's a reasonable amount of clinical data available for the use of Pygium africanum for BPH. Uh, this has also been summarized in a Cochrane systematic review, uh, last updated in 2008. In this analysis, they looked at data from 18 randomized control trials, uh, comprising 1,562 men in total. Mean duration of follow-up was 64 days. Uh, 18 studies met inclusion criteria. Out of those, 12 of them were published in non-English language, and none of them are conducted in North America. Total of five studies reported symptom improvement as rated by the physician at endpoint. Men receiving Pygium africanum were more than twice as likely to rate their symptoms as being improved versus the men who received the placebo. None of the studies uh, were reported using validated questionnaires or IPSS scores or AUA symptom scores. Three studies provided data on nocturia, and a pooled analysis of the data from these studies did not statistically demonstrate any improvement in nocturia. Four studies reported on peak urinary flow rates and pooled analysis, meta-analysis of the data showed a statistically significant improvement in peak urinary flow rate of approximately 2.5 mils per second. Of the 18 studies, 13 studies included information on adverse events, 
No study reported any serious adverse events, and none found a statistically significant incidence of any adverse events versus placebo. The overall conclusion of the Cochrane uh, Systematic review was that Pygeum africana may be a useful treatment option in men with lower urinary tract symptoms consistent with BPH. However, they do point out that reviewed studies were of short duration, rarely reported outcomes using standardized and validated measures of efficacy, and uh, more study was necessary. So the bottom line for Pygeum africanum seems to be that it may have some beneficial effect in lowering your lower urinary tract symptoms in men with BPH. Conclusions are limited by the small uh, studies that are available and larger placebo-controlled trials with validated symptom score follow-up is uh, necessary before we can uh, make our decision. Rye pollen extract, or Cernilton, is another common natural health product uh, promoted for lower urinary tract symptoms in men with BPH. It's also known as uh, Sacale Cereal. Uh, Cernilton is used uh, to treat lower urinary tract symptoms in Western Europe, Japan, Korea, quite commonly. Cernilton is rich in uh, beta-sterols, which are thought to be the active ingredient. The exact mechanism of action of Cernilton is uh, unknown. Again, it's been hypothesized to have antiandrogenic effects to relax smooth muscle of the urethra and uh, increase detrusor contractility, uh, alpha blocker effects. Uh, Cochrane Review is also available, published in 2008, uh, reviewing the available randomized control uh, data for Cernilton. Uh, only four studies have been done with a total of 444 patients, mean follow-up of 12 to 24 months, or sorry, weeks. Um, only two of the studies were tested against placebo. One study was tested against Pygium africanum, and one study tested against another Japanese phytotherapeutic uh, known as Paraprost. One uh, RCT double-blinded placebo-controlled trial uh, of uh, approximately 60 patients attempted to measure uh, urinary symptoms objectively. They used the uh, Boyarsky symptom score. Now, the Boyarsky symptom index is one of the earliest symptom scores. It's not been tested for validity or reliability, and it, uh, in essence, requires a clinician to interpret uh, improvement in patient symptoms. Uh, nonetheless, in this study, uh, patients self-reported a significant improvement in symptoms, more than twice as often as if they were uh, on placebo. Um, correlation with clinical relevance is difficult, but they did uh, say they were improved. Nocturia reports were reported in two studies versus placebo. And more than two times, uh, or patients were more than two times as likely to report improvement in nocturia. Uh, there was no number given, but improvement in nocturia with Cernilton versus placebo. Peak urine flow was reported in one uh, small study. It didn't show any statistically significant improvement in Cernilton over placebo. Adverse events were rare. Uh, one case of nausea was reported in, in one of the studies with Sue Milton. So the, in summary, rye pollen or, or Sue Milton is well tolerated. It may provide a modest subjective improvement in symptoms for men with BPH. Uh, the studies are of small numbers and of short duration. Um, so there, there may be a role for Sue Milton in lower urinary tract symptoms, but uh, certainly again more study is needed before this uh, becomes clear. And the last uh, BPH phytotherapeutic I want to talk about is, uh, is the South African star grass, or Hypoxus ruperi. Uh, the active ingredient is thought to be beta-cystosterols. Uh, it's a plant sterol uh, with a structure similar to cholesterol. Uh, beta-cystosterols are found in cashews, avocados, soybeans, corn oils, uh, also found in saw palmetto and Pygium africanum. Again, the uh, mechanism of action of beta-cystosterols is unknown. Uh, some hypothesize it might be related to alterations in cholesterol metabolism uh, or anti-inflammatory effects uh, via interference with the prostaglandin uh, metabolism. 
A uh, Cochrane review of the literature performed in 2008 looked at the evidence for beta cystostrols in the treatment of BPH and the available data. They identified four studies that uh, tested beta cystostrol versus placebo in a total of 519 men who had mild to moderate symptoms. Uh, follow up ranged from four to 26 weeks. The uh, four studies used verified, uh, sorry, various plant extracts as their source for uh, beta cystostrol, uh, most, African, the, most uh, often the African stargrass. Uh, IPSS uh, symptom scores were reported in two of the studies. The pooled uh, meta-analysis weighted mean difference uh, in IPSS score was an improvement of uh, 4.9 points. That's a, a reasonably significant uh, improvement from their baseline. <clears throat> uh, patient subjective satisfaction with treatment was reported in one study. Uh, greater than eight times more patients uh, reported the efficacy of their therapy as very good or good compared to those who received placebo. Physicians were similarly more likely to report uh, patient response as good or very good uh, compared to placebo. Here we see greater than 11 times as likely. Nocturia results were only reported in one study and did uh, decrease by one episode per night uh, compared to placebo, uh, statistically significant. Peak urine flow rates were reported in all four of the studies. Uh, the meta-analysis weighted mean improvement in peak urine flow was about four mils per second. Uh, adverse events due to beta cystosterol are rare, generally mild in nature and uh, comparable in frequency to placebo. Uh, GI side effects were the most common, 1.6% uh, of uh, men receiving beta cystosterol versus uh, none in placebo. And uh, interestingly, erectile dysfunction was reported in uh, half a percent of men on beta cystosterol, not reported in any men taking placebo. The uh, conclusions of the authors of this systematic review uh, was that beta cystosterols may improve urinary flow rates in men with BPH. But the bottom line, herbal preparations containing uh, beta cystosterol may help relieve symptoms in BPH. The data looks interesting. Uh, they seem to improve subjective symptoms and they do improve flow rates. Uh, they're well tolerated in the short term, uh, but again, we don't have any long-term data. Uh, Further uh, larger studies are required before uh, we can confidently recommend this. So for BPH, uh, the most available data is for saw palmetto. Uh, it appears not to have any significant benefit over placebo, uh, but it does give us that placebo effect. Uh, the African plum, rye pollen, and African star grass all have a, a small amount of data that, that is interesting. Um, it suggests that it does have a possible improvement in symptoms, uh, and certainly I think it's warranted to uh, do more research in, in these three areas. So let's uh, switch gears here a little bit and look at some of the evidence behind the use of common natural health products in the prevention of uh, prostate cancer. We'll review the data behind vitamin E, uh, selenium, look a little bit at vitamin D, uh, in prevention of prostate cancer, not in bone health uh, or that. Uh, we'll look at lycopene and then uh, a quick look at pomegranate extract. Uh, vitamin E is one of the most talked about nutritional supplements in prostate cancer, largely uh, because of the attention it got during the SELECT trial. SELECT trial is the largest clinical trial in medical history. Um, it investigated the effect of vitamin E and selenium on uh, the risk of prostate cancer. Vitamin E refers to a, a group of fat-soluble compounds, uh, including gamma tocopherol, alpha tocopherol. Now, gamma tocopherol is the most common uh, source in the diet of North Americans, but uh, alpha tocopherol is the most active uh, biologically. Uh, alpha tocopherol is found in, in wheat germ, sunflower and safflower oils, other nuts and nut oils such as almonds and hazelnuts 
Uh, it's also found in tomatoes, sweet potatoes, green leafy vegetables, avocados. Uh, vitamin E acts as an antioxidant. It's uh, thought to protect cell membranes from oxidation. Selenium, uh, chemical number 34 on your periodic table, uh, it's, a, it's an essential micronutrient in animals. It acts as a cofactor uh, for the reduction and, and oxidation uh, of enzymes such as the glutathione peroxidase. Uh, it's involved in the reduction of reactive oxygen species. <clears throat> Dietary sources of selenium include nuts, cereals, fish, meat, eggs, mushrooms, uh, as well as shellfish. If taken in excess, selenium uh, doses of greater than 400 to 800 milligrams per day, uh, it can be toxic, leading to uh, a condition known as selenosis, uh, which gives you a GI upset, hair loss, neurologic dysfunction, cirrhosis, uh, pulmonary edema and reports of death have, uh, have occurred with uh, selenium overdoses. Selenium and vitamin E were thought to be promising in, in cancer prevention back in the 1990s. Uh, secondary outcomes of two randomized control trials, the Nutritional Prevention and Cancer Trial, the NPC trial, and the alpha tocopherol beta carotene cancer prevention trial, the ATBC trial. Uh, Secondary analysis showed a reduction in prostate cancer incidence with both uh, uh, interventions. Cancer risk reduction of 63% uh, were seen for selenium supplementation, and 30% uh, reductions were seen for uh, <clears throat> vitamin E. So thus, this is pretty exciting. So a large uh, <coughs> randomized control trial, the SELECT trial, was uh, formed uh, and carried out from 2001 to 2008 uh, to try to see if, uh, if these would indeed reduce prostate cancer uh, risk. The SELECT trial was a multi-center randomized placebo-controlled trial of over 35,000 men at 427 sites in Canada, the U.S., and Puerto Rico. Uh, these men were randomly assigned to receive selenium, vitamin E, both, or placebo. Uh, the trial included men over the age of 55, uh, or 50 if they're African-Americans. Baseline PSA had to be less than 4 and, uh, with a non-suspicious DRE. Now, the uh, study was terminated early. It was terminated in year 7 of a planned 12-year uh, study uh, because interim analysis found no evidence of benefit of either selenium or vitamin E alone or in combination. It was about this time that uh, concerns regarding the possibly harmful effects of high-dose vitamin E were arising. One meta-analysis published in 2005 in the uh, Annals of Internal Medicine and another trial published <clears throat> in JAMA in 2007 concluded that vitamin E at doses over 400 units per day increased all-cause mortality. Now, this wasn't seen statistically in the SELECT trial, uh, but the doses they used in the SELECT trial were uh, not as large and the population was a general population that was overall more healthy. Nonetheless, supplementation with vitamin E and selenium did not alter risk of uh, prostate cancer development, and uh, the trial was stopped. Actually, vitamin E increased the risk. It wasn't statistically, it wasn't statistically significant. There was a trend towards more prostate cancer. In vitamin E. In selenium, there was a definite increase in diabetes. The... The, uh, in, in type 2 diabetes with selenium, yeah, possibly. Again, I don't think that was statistically significant either. Yeah. That's why they stopped. Yeah, but the, but the main thing, it was it was showed no effect. So, so overall, there's no data to support uh, supplementation using either vitamin E or selenium uh, for the prevention of prostate cancer. So let's look at vitamin D. <clears throat> vitamin D is a fat-soluble vitamin uh, present in fish, meat, eggs, mushrooms, and it's found in our fortified dairy products. Uh, it's produced endogenously through sun exposure as well. Its role in calcium hemostasis we know all about, uh, but it also seems to play a role in regulation of cell growth, neuromuscular and immune functions, and, and the inflammatory response. Historically, there's been some interest in vitamin D as a possible uh, and its possible link to uh, prostate cancer based upon observational studies. 
correlate the data of UV radiation exposure and prostate cancer incidence. They're inversely related. Areas with less sun exposure presumably have lower levels of endogenous vitamin D production and also have been shown to have higher incidences of prostate cancer. In vitro laboratory studies have also demonstrated anti-proliferative effects of vitamin D on prostate tumor cell lines. And several studies have linked pleomorphisms in the vitamin D receptor uh, to prostate cancer cells. When it comes to data in human trials, the evidence is limited for the role of vitamin D in the prevention of prostate cancer. Uh, a Medline search that I did of uh, prostate cancer and vitamin D did not return any prospective randomized control trials of vitamin D supplementation. A meta-analysis published by Yin in the Journal of Cancer Epidemiology in 2009, it reviewed the available literature on vitamin D serum levels and the associated prostate cancer risk. They identified 11 prospective cohort studies that looked at uh, serum vitamin D levels and prostate cancer incidence. Uh, a meta-analysis of the data did not demonstrate any association between prostate cancer <clears throat> and serum vitamin D levels. So the bottom line in summary seems that although vitamin D is an exciting area of research in prostate cancer regulation uh, in the lab, uh, currently there's no clinical evidence to suggest that supplementation with vitamin D alters prostate cancer risk. The association of lycopene with prostate cancer risk is another common question that uh, we get in patients. You know, how many cans of tomato juice should I drink a day? Lycopene is a bright red carotenoid most commonly found in tomatoes, other red fruits like watermelon and papaya. Lycopene is not an essential nutrient, uh, but it's found commonly in the North American diet. Um, when total lycopene intake is large, lycopene has been shown to localize uh, into prostate tissue. Lycopene is hypothesized to reduce prostate cancer risk due to its action as an antioxidant. Uh, early correlations between diets rich in uh, lycopene suggested that increased lycopene in the diet was uh, linked to uh, decreased prostate cancer incidence. The largest uh, study to date describing the relationship of lycopene and prostate cancer risk uh, was a nested control trial within the uh, PLCO cancer screening trial. This was published back in 2007. This study took uh, 692 patients from the screening arm of the PLCO trial who were diagnosed with prostate cancer. Um, they were compared to 844 age match controls and lycopene serum levels were measured at baseline. They found no correlation between serum lycopene levels and prostate cancer risk. <clears throat> uh, data describing the intake of lycopene uh, containing products um, and tomato-based foods uh, also does not support its use in the prevention of prostate cancer. A prospective uh, study published by Kirsch in 2006, uh, they again characterized the, in the intake of lycopene in, in men in the PLCO trial. Um, participants filled out a 137 item food questionnaire uh, prospectively and were followed uh, throughout the PLCO study. Now, there were no uh, associations between uh, lycopene intake, tomato based food intake, and the eventual risk of uh, prostate cancer diagnosis. So in summary, neither lycopene serum levels nor lycopene intake seem to be associated with uh, prostate cancer risk. And currently there's no uh, data to support lycopene supplementation for prostate cancer risk. Now, one of the uh, supplements getting a lot of attention now is, is pomegranate fruit. But uh, it's been used for centuries, um, believed to have medicinal properties, and it's been shown to be quite a powerful antioxidant. Uh, it's promoted in liquid and capsule form as a chemopreventative agent for prostate cancer. And uh, on the internet, you can find lots of sites that will sell it to you. Uh, there's a polyphenol in it that's uh, implicated as bioactive constituent responsible for, over, for greater than 50% of its uh, antioxidant properties. So although studies in, in human subjects are lacking, there's none, uh, there's been 
actually some interesting in vitro studies that have supported the hypothesis that pomegranate juice extract could play a role in uh, regulation of prostate cancer cell lines. Uh, the, there was an interesting study presented in 2005 in the uh, journal Cell Cycle uh, that looked at prostate cancer cell lines that were incubated with pomegranate fruit extract. And they showed a dose-dependent inhibition of prostate cancer growth. Uh, this inhibition was thought uh, was hypothesized to be due to uh, inhibition of cyclin-dependent kinases in the prostate cancer pathway, uh, growth pathway. Um, so it, it's interesting lab data, but uh, a Medline search of any available human trials using pomegranate extract uh, returned no, no results. So the bottom line for pomegranate juice, there's no clinical trials in humans. Uh, to support its supplementation at its time, but, but there is that one interesting lab study that does generate some uh, hypotheses. So uh, maybe further study is, uh, is warranted in, in pomegranate juice. So unfortunately for uh, prostate cancer chemo prevention, neither selenium nor vitamin E are, are recommended. Vitamin D seems to play a role in prostate cancer cell line regulation, but hasn't been shown... Uh, uh, to change prostate cancer risk in supplementation. Lycopene serum levels and, and intake don't change your prostate cancer risk. And uh, while well, pomegranate juice uh, lacks human data, there is uh, that one interesting lab study. Yeah, she's done a lot of research. In. Uh, next, I want to quickly touch on, on two phytotherapies that are promoted in chronic prostatitis uh, or chronic pelvic pain, um, Quisertin, and uh, again, we'll look at Rypollin uh, or Cernilton. Uh, Quisertin we see often at the BC Cancer Agency for post-radiation prostatitis, so I wanted to take a look at it. It's a plant-derived flavonoid found in uh, many fruits and vegetables, including red wine, onions, green tea. It's uh, promoted in a supplement called Prosta-Q. Um, documented actions of quercetin include antioxidant activity, tyrosine kinase inhibition, nitric oxide inhibition, and, and anti-inflammatory effects through interference with NF-kappa-B. Uh, a Medline search of the literature only uncovers one study that looks at uh, quercetin in men with prostatitis. It was an open-label trial of quercetin done in 1999 that showed that some men with chronic non-bacterial prostatitis had improvement in symptoms uh, with quercetin supplementation. It looked at 30 men uh, who were diagnosed with chronic non-bacterial prostatitis, randomized them to receive either 500 milligrams of uh, quercetin twice daily uh, or placebo for one month. They measured symptoms using the NIH uh, chronic prostatitis symptom score. Uh, they found that after one month of therapy, more patients receiving quercetin had an improvement in their symptoms uh, uh, than those receiving placebo. Two-thirds of patients uh, receiving quercetin had an improvement of greater than 25%, uh, thought to be statistically significant increase in or, uh, sorry, reduction in, the, in their symptomatology. Um, only 20% of those uh, receiving placebo had a significant uh, improvement in symptoms. I couldn't find uh, any other trials looking at uh, uh, quisertin and its role in, in chronic prostatitis. One uh, interesting tidbit about quisertin is that it's, it has a binding site on DNA gyrase. Uh, it hasn't been shown to do anything to it, um, but because of this, uh, it's not recommended that uh, quinolone antibiotics are taken at the same time uh, if your patients are receiving or are taking um, quisertin. So the bottom line, you know, in this small study and, and the anecdotal experience um, presented, it, it appears that it's safe. Uh, there may be a role for its use in, in chronic prostatitis. Uh, an effect was seen in this small study. Um, so maybe further study uh, 
would be necessary so that we can add this to our armamentarium for these, these difficult patients. Uh, another phytotherapeutic thought to be of use in, in chronic prostatitis is rye pollen extract. Uh, we discussed this earlier in BPH. Uh, again, it's thought to have anti-inflammatory properties and it's thought to inhibit the arachidonic acid, uh, acid cascade of inflammation. Um, this was a prospective placebo-controlled randomized control trial of 139 patients who received either placebo or sunilton for, tw uh, for 12 weeks. Uh, again, they quantified symptoms using the NIH uh, chronic prostatitis symptom uh, inventory. So you can see here they, they demonstrated a, a significant decrease in symptom score in both uh, the pain domain uh, and in total uh, NIH uh, CPSI score. So they concluded that uh, Sir Nilton supplementation significantly improved their total symptoms, uh, said it improved their quality of life and uh, was possibly of use in patients with uh, chronic pelvic pain syndrome. So uh, in summary, both Sir Nilton and uh, Quisertin have shown some interesting results in chronic pelvic uh, pain. They may be uh, of use in, in, in these difficult uh, patients. Uh, so further study might be interesting to see uh, what results we can get. Lastly, I want to talk about natural health products and their use in the prevention of urinary tract infections or, or bladder symptoms. Uh, we'll first look at the data for uh, cranberry extract uh, and cranberry juice, a little bit about probiotics, uh, the new crazed D mannose, and uh, high dose vitamin C. The most uh, common supplement promoted for use in UTIs is obviously cranberry juice and cranberry extract. Cranberries have been uh, promoted for decades for the prevention and treatment of urinary tract infections. Uh, cranberries are uh, approximately 90% water, but they also have some organic acids, including quinic acid, malic acid, citric acid, uh, as well as uh, glucose and fructose. The definitive uh, mechanism of action of cranberry juice is, is, is largely unknown. Until recently, it was thought that the uh, high quinic acid load in the, the cranberry extract was converted to hippuric acid uh, in the urine, uh, acidifying the urine and asking as an antimicrobial. Recently, this has uh, been shown that uh, high doses of hippuric acid uh, don't change urinary pH at all. Um, the predominant uh, hypothesis currently is that cranberry uh, acts to prevent bacterial adhesion uh, either through fructose inhibition of mannose-dependent binding sites on E. coli or through uh, proanthocyanins, which inhibit the galactose-mediated uh, adherence of E. coli. There's a recent Cochrane systematic review of the literature and meta-analysis looking at uh, the data for cranberry extract uh, in its role in prevention of urinary tract infections. Uh, ten studies uh, were found that compared cranberry juice and cranberry cocktail versus placebo uh, for the prevention of UTI. This is a total of uh, over a thousand patients uh, that are available for review. <clears throat> when the uh, pooled data was analyzed, a significant reduction in the recurrence rate of urinary tract infections in those receiving cranberry products was seen. It's a relative risk of 0.66 for a recurrence of infection. <coughs> Um, the quality of the data available for the meta-analysis does have limitations, however. Garbage, uh, garbage in, garbage out. Um, some of the studies didn't disclose their randomization. Others uh, didn't disclose their dosage of cranberry extract or, or what they used. Um, and uh, overall, st the study numbers were small, 1,000 patients in, in 10 studies. Uh, but the uh, cranberry supplements uh, did appear to be safe. Um, the main complaints were uh, bitter taste and then the caloric load from the uh, high intake of juice. Interestingly, the dropout rates varied between 20 and 55 percent in these studies, uh, which suggests to me that uh, over the long term, tolerability of cranberry might be uh, limited. Uh, so presented here is a summary of the, the four trials included in the meta-analysis. Um, as you can see, most of the data sets were small. 
when analyzed individually, did not show a statistically significant uh, difference crossing the midline. But the overall meta-analysis of the pooled data uh, did show uh, a significant reduction in the recurrence of urinary tract infections. Uh, when subgroups of patients uh, were looked at uh, separately, uh, it appeared as if the protective effect was best in uh, women with recurrent infections and uh, did not reach, uh, did not uh, seem to have an effect in, in the neurogenic patients. So overall, this systematic uh, review and meta-analysis done by the Cochrane database concluded that uh, cranberry products can be uh, effective in reducing UTIs, especially in women with chronic uh, uh, recurrent urinary tract infections. Uh, and the evidence uh, appears that it's not effective in neuro neurogenic bladders. Uh, and a more recent study uh, was published in the Journal of uh, Clinical Infectious Disease in 2011. It was a double-blind, placebo-controlled, randomized control trial uh, of college-age women who presented with acute urinary tract infections. Now, they were randomized to placebo, or eight ounces of cranberry juice per day. Uh, they were followed for six months or until their first recurrence. Um, recurrence rate was 20% in those that received cranberry juice and only 14% in placebo. Uh, they didn't see a statistically significant decrease in, in recurrence. So what's the bottom line? Um, the clinical evidence is mixed. Um, the meta-analysis seemed to support the use of cranberry products in the prevention of UTIs, uh, especially women with recurrent infections. Um, it's certainly a safe to use. Uh, tolerability is uh, unknown. Uh, dropout rates were quite high. Um, I think we know that uh, the data doesn't suggest it's of use in the neurogenic patients. Uh, but uh, larger trials in, in women would, uh, and pediatrics would be interesting. Um, so for UTIs, another commonly promoted natural supplement is, is probiotics. Uh, you can get a ton of them uh, at, at any supplement store. Now, probiotics are, are live microorganisms which, when uh, administered, confer a health benefit to the patient. That's what the definition is. And uh, in prevention of UTIs, uh, typically probiotics refers to acidophilus and, and bifidobacterium. Same stuff that's in uh, Activia yogurt. Uh, probiotics are uh, hypothesized to have either competitive inhibition effects, uh, and others say it might possibly uh, modulate the immune system, uh, but those uh, are difficult to prove. Now, the London Health Protection Agency has come out with a statement saying that probiotics are safe. Uh, human uh, infection with probiotics are extraordinarily rare, and uh, they say that probiotics can be used in anyone, from pediatrics to the immunocompromised. Um, there's four available randomized control trials that look at the use of probiotics for the prevention of UTIs. Um, they're summarized in, in, in this review article here published in 2008. Now, it's a, it's a busy slide, uh, but I'll, I'll go over it. Um, three of the studies uh, used vaginal suppositories in women with recurrent urinary tract infections, and uh, one of the studies uh, used a drink containing probiotics. All four of the studies showed no effect in recurrence rate of UTIs with probiotics, either vaginally or orally. So the bottom line for probiotics, there's currently no data for their use in urinary tract infections, uh, although the data in uh, IBS is good. Uh, and the last two that uh, Dr. Patterson wanted me to add where he says all his patients are coming in asking about uh, D-mannose. Uh, if you do a Google search of D-mannose and UTIs, you get over 30,000 hits. Uh, mannose is, uh, is a sugar monomer that we don't metabolize, so it's uh, excreted unchanged in the urine. Uh, vir virulence factors for E. coli um, include adhesion to the uroepithelium, and some of these are mannose dependent. Uh, so it's hypothesized that mannose uh, may interfere uh, with this. However, more frequently adherence is mannose independent. 
the, the claims that by taking mannose in your diet, you can block the mannose-dependent adherence of E. coli. Um, and of the 30,000 hits, <clears throat> uh, none of them uh, produce any data. There's no uh, lab uh, data showing uh, interaction with the, uh, the E. coli domain, nor any trials in humans. So there's no scientific basis of, of this uh, supplement at this time. And then the last one is, is high-dose vitamin C for the prevention of urinary tract infections. <clears throat> it's supposed to work by acidification of the urine, uh, preventing bacterial growth. Um, but it's been shown in two, two trials that either in high dose when given intravenously or very high doses orally, uh, it doesn't actually alter urinary pH. So the bottom line for vitamin C, uh, no trials have been done in humans that have looked at supplementation for the re recurrence of urinary tract infections, and the hypothesis that uh, it could help by acidifying the urine has been disproven in, in, in two studies. So in summary, for, for urinary tract infections, uh, cranberry products may be useful, uh, maybe in women uh, with recurrent infections, uh, however the other commonly uh, promoted products such as probiotics, uh, vitamin C, and D-mannose uh, don't seem to have any evidence to support their use. So nutraceuticals, phytotherapies, complementary medicines, whatever you want to call them, they're commonplace. Our, our patients are more likely to be taking those than traditional Western medicines. Uh, they're also more likely to not tell you that they're taking them because of the stance that most uh, or a lot of uh, doctors take on them. But as we've seen here, there, is, there are some of the phytotherapies and, and nutritional supplements that have shown some promise in small clinical trials. Uh, bef before we can uh, make these mainstream, however, I think it's uh, important that uh, we take them under uh, and scrutinize them just like we would other drugs. Uh, only once uh, we've done the trials can we uh, conclusively tell our patients uh, that uh, they either work or, or don't work, and uh, we can make informed decisions then. So with that, I'll uh, stop, and uh, just like to thank Dr. Patterson for for uh, his help with this presentation. <clears throat>